the nature of the problems that we are dealing with right now is so complex that you cannot solve them from just one perspective. You need a lot of people. You need a lot of skills. You need a lot of talents. So that means that you need better ways, more collaboration, more design thinking, more curiosity and creativity to solve those problems from from a variety of, of perspectives and not just one mindset, so to speak. Who's the philosopher that said uh, we're not going to solve problems from the same level of thinking that created them? Oh, Einstein. Yeah, I, okay. What, you're talking about one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> you know, if you read all my, my articles in LinkedIn, I talk a lot about that quote because I interviewed someone a few months ago for my for my podcast, and this person said that we are still trying to solve the same problems that we had 50 years ago. Now these problems have maybe a different phase, but the nature of those problems is the same. So we are still trying to solve the problems with the same level of thinking that we had when we created them, which is exactly what Albert Einstein said. So what is, what is it that we need right now to solve more complex problems? No, collaboration. We need to bring people from diverse backgrounds. We need to bring people from diverse expertise. But we, we have to tell them that they need to be curious around the nature of those problems and around potential solutions. Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Welcome to episode number 49. I'm your host, Bill Murphy. I'm continuing in my search to find and interview the best people, experts who will offer you inspiration and challenge your thinking in the areas related to building exponential organizations, solving complex problems, people who are deep in the cutting edge with their thinking related to human potential, like Wim Hof, for example, experts in enterprise IT security, folks who understand exponential technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual reality, augmented reality, and also those who can help us apply creativity in the application of principles that work and will benefit you so you can be the best you you can be in business and in life. I'm excited to bring to you my interview with Enrique Rubio. He and I share a favorite quote. It is, you can't solve problems from the same level of thinking that created them. That's from Einstein. And how many times in life do we have problems and we're trying to solve it from that level, but when we read something interesting, something different and new, it helps us reframe our problem. And I was interested to bring Enrique onto the show because he has a great depth of knowledge and understanding perplexing challenges unique to our generation. How do we in the Western world who live in a world of abundance solve complex problems in the developing world? How do we deploy exponential technologies in a sustainable way that makes the lives of others better? Enrique works for the Inter-American Development Bank. He's also an electronic engineer, a Fulbright scholar with an executive master's degree in public administration from Syracuse. He's an active blogger and a podcaster and also a competitive ultra runner. And I'm going to have on the show notes page, links to where you can find his podcast as well, which is very, very fun to listen to. Things that you'll learn from this episode are about design thinking. What is design thinking and how can you deploy design thinking and collaboration to solve complex problems? Also, the problem with heavy strategic design versus the advantage of resource constraints. Also, the power of experiments. Enrique talks about cheap, flexible, nimble experiments and how to deploy them. He also talks about entrepreneurship and nomads and the Himalayas and solar panels. It's a really fun story there about that. Also, what is a social entrepreneur in his mind? How can a social entrepreneurship be deployed in solving complex problems? And the power of curiosity and being open-minded. This episode is sponsored by the CIO Scoreboard. Are you looking for a way to fight off auditors, communicate your IT security strategy, your execution and planning? Do you have a way to simply, defensively, holistically, and logically report this plan to your boss, 
the board and your team. There is a tool and a process that you can do this and it's called the CIO scoreboard. Check out the visualcio.com to learn more. Again, that's the visualcio.com. Thank you for listening and for your patience. Now on with the show, and I want to welcome you to my discussion with Enrique Rubio. You know, as we were talking, a couple of things that I you're really passionate about and I'm really interested in, because I'm not as well versed in this area, is design thinking. And so maybe if you could give me an example or a story of how design thinking is used in your world to solve a complex problem. I would really like to understand what design thinking is from your point of view, and then also like the story of how it was used to potentially solve a complex problem, if you could. Well, talking about design thinking to solve complex problems, I I got an example about that. I, I recently interviewed someone from Denver, they have a fantastic organization working with design thinking and, and the public and private sector. So they went to the Michigan government and they were trying to solve one problem that they had, which is the forms to help people that were trying to get some help from the government because they were unemployed. These forms had about 60 something pages and that was creating a lot of work, not only for the people requesting help, but also for the public employees trying to help these people. So they started analyzing with design thinking. They started first seeing how people were experiencing the problems that they were having. So how people requesting help and how public employees were perceiving and experiencing the problem. So once they understood that, they were able to design a number of solutions to experiment with those solutions they had to leave aside some of the things that they thought at the beginning of the project. And they started seeing that some of the solutions that they were implementing were working, that they needed to do some tweaks to that solution. But once they understood the problem, they experimented with a particular solution. They were able to scale that solution to another level to propose it to the Michigan government. So they went from 60 something pages of a form to less than six pages in the form in a new form that is much easier to use for people, for customers, for public employees, is cheaper for the government because it's saving them literally millions of hours. So design thinking helps you. The first step in design thinking is having empathy around the problems that people have. So many organizations and many people try to solve problems revolving around the processes that they have in place, or the financial sustainability of the of the organization or the business model of the organization. And they overlook the fact that the ones experiencing the problem are people at the end of the day. So the design thinking shift the mindset from revolving around processes or, or things to revolving around people, to revolving around how people experience problems. So that is empathy. You need to have a lot of empathy to use design thinking. So once you start seeing a particular community, so to speak, or a particular target of the population that is experiencing a problem and you understand very well how they are experiencing that problem, you can then go to a new stage in the design thinking process. And that new stage is creating potential solutions, potential alternatives. So you might have a group of people, like I said at the beginning, uh, based on collaboration and on diverse groups and on curiosity and creativity, you bring a lot of people together to the table to think how to solve that problem that you already understand. So there might be, I don't know, let's say a hundred type of solutions on the table. So you apply certain methodologies to those solutions and you say, well, from a hundred, we only have five solutions right now. And then you decide what to do with those solutions. If it's cheap to do, you can experiment. And by experimenting, what I mean is taking a little sector, a little piece of of the entire population that is experiencing the problem and applying one of those solutions to them and observing how people are reacting to that particular solution. So when you do that, when you do that experimentation process, it gives you information on whether your initial assumptions about that solution are true or not. 
So let's say that at the beginning of the, of, let's go back to this example of, of Denver and this group of people working in there with design thinking. If you design a form that has 10 pages and you think that that's the best form, you give it to people. And when you observe people, they have no idea how to use that form. But your initial assumption was the form is very clear. So people will know how to use it, but they don't. So you have to switch uh, some things around because your initial assumption is not being proven right, proven correct. So you need to go back to the design table and say, you know what? This 10 pages form is not providing the type of answer that we need for people to have. So we need to redesign it and we need to go back to the field and experiment with it again. So there might be a point when you get to that 10 pages or six pages form, in the case of this particular project, you give it to people and you observe how they use it and you see them using it and you understand that they know how to use it, that it's a smooth process for them, that is taking, I don't know, an hour versus three or four hours that it used to take before. And you say, you know what, now that form is working well. So you decide to scale that solution as the next step. So design thinking is a very clear process of defining a problem, bringing people to the table in order to analyze potential solutions, picking some of those solutions using some methodologies and experimenting with them. And that is experimentation process will give you some information. So it will tell you 10 pages is too much, six pages is all right. Five questions is too much. You need to redefine those questions into these two or three questions. And once you experiment, you decide whether to scale the solution because it works pretty well, or you decide whether to pivot to another area because the initial solution was not what you thought it was going to be. And I have another example of that. I interviewed someone, a fascinating woman. She created a company called One Earth Designs. They created a solar oven for people in the Himalayas and how it worked for her. She went to the Himalayas and she lived among nomads for a long time. And one of the things that she observed was that the people didn't have enough fuel to build fireplaces or something for their food. And on top of that, since they were nomads, they could not move around the kitchens or the stoves that the government was providing them because it, they were really heavy. So she said, we need to do something about it. So she created, with an engineer, she created a solar oven. She gave it to them, to the people, to the nomads. They were experimenting with the first prototype of that oven. It was still too heavy. It was not too sturdy. It was going away with the wind. So she decided to go back to the design table to redo it again. And then she went back to the people. She gave it another experiment, another prototype. So she kept going back and forth between people and design table until she found the perfect solar oven. And now she's selling it and she's doing pretty well. So that's another example of design thinking applied to a compelling social problem. This is in the Himalayas. So she understood the problem. She designed several solutions. She experimented together with people going back to the design table when it was needed. And then she said, this is the final solution. This is the one that is working. Let's scale it and let's make it bigger and let's make it better or, or let's try to reach more people because our assumptions and our design has proven to work well. So that's a little bit of how design thinking works and why I think the best advantage of using this tool in the real world is that it allows you to collaborate. It allows you to understand the way people are experiencing or experimenting some problems in their communities, in their countries, in their uh, lives, and how you can design a small experiments that are cheap. Usually they are very cheap and you can go out to experiment, to use those prototypes and experiment with them and then come back to the design table to redo whatever is necessary to be redone. It's really interesting that you talk about cheap experiments and and uh, I really appreciate the, the examples you gave because it was interesting. One was a public sector example and the other one was really a, a kind of bootstrap entrepreneur. And, and you know, the, and the concept of innovation at the edge and the, the, with using exponential uh, thinking, uh, this, this concept of cheap experimentation, uh, are you finding that it's more successful in smaller entrepreneurial spaces or are also, is it being, can be applied in public sector? Oh, absolutely, I think that 
not only do I think that, but I have experienced it myself. I had sat up and, you know, we decided at the beginning to invest all this money and try to go as big as possible, developing all these modules for, for our platform. And then when we put it out there for people to use, people didn't even understand what it was for. So my mistake was trying to develop something too big at the same time, using a lot of time and a lot of money into something that I didn't know whether people wanted it or needed it at all. So the advantage of cheap experimentation and quick turnarounds in this process is that it gives you quick information. It gives you information yeah. very, very fast. So if you design something cheap and small and you put it out there and people kind of want it and they are trying to understand how it works, but they don't really know how it works, you can go back to the design table, tweak it a little bit and go out again to the field. So then you start in that back and forth process that allows you to, in a very cheap way, in a very fast way, incorporate the way people want to experience and want to use the products or services that you are designing for them. So it's cheap because, again, you don't need to invest a lot of money in those type of solutions. It is quick because you go back and forth with people. It is human-centered design because you don't dump solutions and, and services on people. You work with them in designing those solutions because their feedback is fundamental for yeah. you to design the services or products that you need. And sorry to interrupt you, Enrique. This is a lot of fun talking about just because I, what I really like hearing, I have so many questions, but remind me to ask you, I want to cover the social entrepreneurship in a moment because I'm just a flat out entrepreneur myself. And I, but I, every single product that we've ever launched, both in the entrepreneur, like the, the innovation within my own company and forming new businesses has always come by testing whether somebody wanted it and whether someone what had to be changed, what had to be tweaked. And so I really love this concept of, of rapid iteration that you, you gave at the early on with the woman in the Himalayas with the oven example. And even yourself, you mentioned the experience of developing software and you developed more of a bigger framework. I bet you learned a lot from that experience, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. And talking about the social sector, you know, which is one of the areas where I think there's a lot of value to be added in terms of how you design solutions for social problems. One thing that is going on is that many nonprofits and big organizations, foundations, they are taking a lot of time to design the type of projects that they want to implement in a particular community. So what happens is that there's a lot of heavy, heavy strategic design at the beginning. And once you start implementing that project, you notice that there are things that are not as you expected them to be. But since you invested so much time at the beginning, you don't want to switch things around throughout the implementation of the project because you say, you know what? I'm going to go forward with what I think is my planning process. I'm not going to switch around because people are not responding the way we want to this particular solution or this particular product or service. So by doing heavy strategic design at the very onset of a you know, after you discover a social problem, you are thinking that people don't change. You are thinking that the way people experience a solution won't change. And that is a very heavy and very expensive mistake. So what's needed, it's a more flexible approach. Actually, that's what Salim Ismail says in the Exponential Organization books. He said that get rid of those five-year strategic plans that you have in your company. You need to start experimenting in a much faster way. And that is exactly what I'm proposing for the social sector using design thinking, that you need to do your strategies, but you need to do them in a way that they are fed by the information you are getting from the environment, that, from the information you're getting from people, rather than implementing something that you heavily design at the beginning but it's not responding to the way or in the way you want it to respond. So that's, it's a switch in the mindset, to be honest. And it's heavy because there are so many people used to heavy planning at the beginning, heavy design at the beginning. And then once they go through the process and they get to the end, when they are going to measure the outcomes, they see outcomes that are not exactly what they expect them to be. They are either lower in the in the impact, lower in the type of outputs or the quality of the outputs or in the way people are using those outputs. So the problem in there is that if you don't switch around or pivot or scale throughout the life of a project, your initial assumptions, you basically are making the mistake of thinking that people will be reacting in the same way 
uh, throughout the life of this project. So you need to be flexible. And that's why this new approach to solving problems is, is so critical. Yeah, I love that. I have a little story. The uh, a gentleman that I, I got my black belt in Taekwondo with him, and he was an older man at the time. I think I might have been 32, and he was probably significantly older at that point. But he had just sold his company for $350 million. And he said to me, we were talking about business plans and such, because I was not that far into my own company at that point. And he said that the day he put together a business plan, and he goes, and the, and the day I walked out of that business plan meeting, I tore it up. He goes, I ripped it apart. There was a certain thinking that process that the business plan provided. But then once he was out, it was in the field, it was more rapid iteration to figure out what the customer needed and wanted. And so, of course, that's a, a commercial example, but it was an in- interesting approach that I never forgot that. So what is a social entrepreneur? Like what, and I appreciate you spending a lot of time talking about design thinking because I really wanted to hear your definition. But then I also hear this word social entrepreneur, and I would love to get your opinion about what that means in your world and to yourself. Well, it's- A social entrepreneur is someone who is trying to solve compelling social problems in the world. And it's an entrepreneur because it's trying to do something in a different way, adding value in a different way, in a more innovative and creative way than has been done before. But the thinking process is geared toward solving social, compelling social problems. It, there's a fine line between what is a social problem right now and what is a business problem right now, right? Like if you think about companies like Uber or Airbnb, you might think like, were they solving social problems? We might consider those as social problems, but a social entrepreneur is more focused on, on the type of problems that we think as making people having a hard time in their lives, hardship in their, in their lives. So for example, poverty, lack of access to education, lack of access to water, diversity and, and inclusion, those environmental issues, those are the type of problems toward which social entrepreneurs are gearing their energy and their creativity and their power, their, their brain power to work on. Okay. So like poverty, education, ed- energy, water, things of that nature? Correct. Yes. Correct. So for example, let me give you an example of what is a social entrepreneur. There's this guy, I don't remember his name, in one country in Africa. I'm, I'm sorry that it's slipping away right now, but This guy, his community didn't have energy, electric energy, right? So he started reading and he collected a lot of recycling materials and he created himself a windmill. Not these big windmills that we're used to seeing everywhere. No, he created a windmill with recycling materials. And with that windmill, he's now been able to help people charge their mobile phones in this community in in one country in Africa that I, I can't remember right now. So he solved a problem, social problem, which is which was the lack of energy in that community in a very innovative and creative way. So he is a social entrepreneur. So he used his energy, his curiosity, his creative power to solve one problem that his community was experiencing. And actually, he was invited to a TED Talk to talk about that experience. And like him, there are many other people around the world. There's this other guy that I've been meaning to to interview. He lives in Malaysia. Uh, he created a company that well, is a company solving a social problem, but it's access to water. So somehow he created a system to collect water from the rain because there's a lot of rain in this area. And the system purifies the water and provides clean water to the community, to people in there. So he solved a social problem in an innovative and creative way. So those are the type of guys that are social entrepreneurs using their brain power, again, curiosity, creativity, innovation to solve compelling social issues. And design thinking, exponential organization type of thinking is very, very much critical. And, I, and I'd say a great way for them to apply their knowledge into solving problems. It's very interesting, like for example, the, this woman that I told you that lived among the nomads in the Himalayas, she didn't know anything about this time thing. But just by her own nature, I, I'd say, by her ingenuity, she was able to design that solution in a process that pretty much is the same than design thinking. So what I'm saying here is that very often we find social entrepreneurs not knowing what design thinking or what exponential organizations or what lean thinking uh, processes are, 
but they are doing it in that way just because that's the way they can do it because they don't have any money to implement heavy strategic planning or expensive solutions. They have a little bit of resources, just a few resources available. Yeah, I, I think this is a really important point you bring up about the kind of limited resources. I find even today, 15, 16 years into my company, there was a mindset of when you didn't have a lot, how you approached a problem versus when you have a few dollars to spare. By the way, the gentleman's name is William Kamkwamba, the one who built the windmills. They did the, the, the TED Talk. So I'll, I'll link that up on the on the show notes page at the end. But yeah, it's it's really interesting, this lean thinking that you're referring to, because that woman didn't have a lot of resources. However, she made it happen with that limited abilities. And, you know, have you read the book Abundance by, the, by any chance? Oh, no, I haven't. It's written by Diamandis and, and uh, Stephen Kotler, and it talks about a... It's an interesting world we're in. We actually have tremendous resources and we have this world of abundance. Of uh, They actually have energy now that you can put in little nuclear reactors that are the size of a refrigerator and you can plop them down in a, in a village and nobody has to manage it and maintain it and it lights up, turn on 10,000 light bulbs. The issue is how do we get these technologies into into these places and and apply these concepts you're you're referring to? So in a world of abundance, how do we get abundance to the to the people that need it the most? Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think having abundance of everything has kind of two sides, right? It's on the one side, you know that once you found a solution for a problem, you have enough resources to scale that solution to solve the problem for many people at the same time and, and not just for a few people. So that's the, that's the positive side. Now, the other side of abundance is that usually we get lost in, in finding the best solution because we have so much of everything that if something doesn't work, we quickly move to something else, but using a lot of resources. So if we were able instead to experiment with cheaper solutions in a faster way without using a lot of resources, I think the impact and, and the pressure on, your, on our brain capacity to create a, a good solution with little money is higher than if you had a lot of resources to implement a solution that and you have money to waste, so to speak. So let me see an example of this. I don't know if you know about the case of the Apollo 13 40 years ago when something happened out there, out of the orbit of the Earth. So I remember watching the movie, which is one of my favorite movies, Apollo 13, and a, a group of engineers came. They had a problem in the shuttle out in the space, and the problem was that they were not being able to purify the carb carbon dioxide that they were creating inside this aircraft. So engineers on Earth came with all these materials that were the only materials that the astronauts had available out there. And they put them on the table and they, like a group of 10 engineers, they said to themselves, we need to create a purifier only with these things because these are the only things that people have available out there. So what I'm trying to say here is that if we could think about ways to designing a solution, knowing that there's abundance, but at the same time, not all the people have this capacity to have access to all these resources, we would be able to scale and sustain those solutions in the longer term. So, you know, if you, if you come to a continent or to a country, a very poor country, and you come with a solution that is very expensive to implement, maybe you will solve a problem for one year. But in the long term, it won't be sustainable because the people in there won't have the capacity to pay for that solution. So now if you come to them with a solution that is cheap, with the resources that they have available in their own environment, and you tell them you work with them in designing that solution, and you use the few resources that they have available in that environment, it will be much easier for them to scale it and sustain it in the long term because what they need is available to them. So I don't know if, if that makes sense. That you know, those are the two sides of this abundance thinking, I would say. I think it makes a, a ton of sense. So essentially what you're saying is as much as possible in this design thinking process is using the resources that are available locally to them to craft the systems or the solutions needed for that particular environment. You have to develop those skills and you have to try to use the resources that you have locally as much as you can, right? Because what happens is that we have experienced this over the past 40 or 50 years or of social and economic development. Many rich countries and rich organizations go to poor countries and poor, you know, with poor NGOs, and they try to implement solutions 
that work in the rich country and they work in the poor country, but only for a short period of time. And the reason why that happens is that people locally don't have neither the skills or the resources to make that solution sustainable in the long term. So if we are able to transfer capacities, to transfer knowledge to those communities, but at the same time work with the resources that they have available, in my opinion, I think we can make the solutions more sustainable in time rather than a one-time solution to a long-term problem. So, so that's, I think that's a little bit of the two sides of this, of this coin. That, that's very interesting. And when you think about solving or creating sort of the managerial structure for the, for the future, do you see an end to, like, how do you see managerial oversight coming into play over the next couple of years? Do you see that ending? Are you seeing, because I know there's sort of a movement to have less managers and more independent teams and, and, and approaches to doing work. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a great question. I think that just by the fact that the nature of the problems that we are experiencing right now is more complex than it has ever been before. The need for more collaboration and diversity and teamwork is higher than ever. So what happened, let's say, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, in the peak of the oil boom and the industrial boom in the United States, for example, just a few people had the knowledge of the things that needed to be done. There were a lot of workers that were actually implementing something, but there were a few people that had the knowledge on how to solve those problems. And these people had a lot of knowledge because there were not much knowledge created by them. So, or there, were, there was a lot, but not as much as we have now. So what happened today is that we are creating so much information. We are creating so much knowledge. The nature of the problems is increasing in complexity at a fast pace that just one person cannot know how to solve a problem and cannot know, wouldn't be able to know how to manage resources in order to solve that problem without the brain power that comes from collaboration and teamwork. So what I think is going to happen in the future is that we are going to see flatter organizations, less hierarchies in, in the organizations. We might be able to see, hopefully, I think, that less managerial oversight in the organization and more teamwork. So what's going to happen, at least as I see it, is that in a team within a company, we are going to see people having more accountabilities based on their talent and their skills. And yes, there will be leadership based on your accountabilities, but that the approach to managerial oversight where people have to report to just one person, I think that's going to disappear. And I think that's what's going to happen is that everyone within a team will have to report to that team, entirely to that team, and not just to one person. So I think that is breaking a little bit with the, um, with the approach of having people reporting to just one person, trying to get feedback from that person on how to solve a problem. And again, that won't be able to happen anymore because that one person that we call the manager today, I think that he, his or her expertise is decreasing over time just because the nature of the problems is more complex now. So that person needs to be involved more in the team. And as they are involved more in a team, their role as a manager will be increasingly disappearing, whereas they role, the role as a team member will be increasingly becoming more evident. So, so it's this sort of flattening of organizations and teams working together in solving problems where accountability is on the team and not just on one person. So I think that's hopefully, I don't know if that's going to happen in the next two years. I don't think so. But I think in the future, more and more organizations will be moving toward a design, an organizational design that revolves around teams rather than hierarchies and heavy structures. Yeah, and I, th I think it's interesting the whole model that that may emerge and, and shift over time because I know in one of your post blog posts I was reading the the World Economic Forum listing the ten critical skills that will be needed in the workforce in 2020, and I think it's surprising. We'll link this up on our on our show notes page for everybody, but uh, I imagine there was a lot of people involved in coming up with this list. But complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision-making, service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive 
flexibility. And I, you just meant, you said in here in your blog, there's 1400 days till 2020. <laughs> so it's not, not a lot of time, but people are supposed to get all these skills or what, what do you, where do you think is the most uh, out of that top 10, if we follow Pareto's principle of, uh, you know, 20% of those skills will get you 80% of the way there. What do you think of the top two? Well, you know what? It's, it's funny, but I think the one that is the top one is not in that list. And I think the one, <laughs> it, the one that is that I consider more most important is curiosity. And uh, it's not just me, actually. You know, Michael Dell, the Dell Incorporated Company uh, CEO, he said that for him, the most important skill that CEOs need to have in the future is curiosity. And what happens is that I also wrote something about those 10 skills that the World Economic Forum is listing versus what curiosity means against those 10 skills. And well, actually, it's not against, it's they work together. If you don't have curiosity, it's very difficult to be creative because to be creative, you need to be asking questions. And to be asking questions, you need, you need to be curious. In order to promote problem solving, you know, like the nature of very complex problems in the world right now, you need to be curious because what happens is that sometimes we see only the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot behind the surface that we are not seeing. And the only way to unveil that information that is hiding in there is by asking questions. So that is, again, curiosity. So all those skills somehow have an answer or have a, something to do with curiosity. So I think that curiosity is the most important skill in the future. But now to be curious you need to be allowed to ask questions. And that's why I think I'm going to go back a little to connect that to the, to the, this concept of the end of managerial oversight. If you're not allowed to ask questions in a team because the manager of that team is afraid that you will kind of unveil that he or she doesn't know the answer to that question, then you won't be one to be curious because your manager will eventually, you know, punish you because you're asking the questions for which he or she doesn't have the answer. Now, in more flat teams where you have this ability to ask questions, I think it's more evident, it's easier, because people in there, they don't have all the knowledge to to solve a particular problem. They don't have all the answers to solve a particular problem. Neither they have all the information that they need to have to solve those problems. They need to ask the questions that help them understand what the problems are and the nature of those problems. That's why I think that in the next four or five years, we need to allow people to ask questions. We need to allow people to be curious because in my opinion, that would be the only way to remain relevant for the future because right now, Bill, there are thousands of people doing exactly the same thing that you and I are doing. And if I want to stay relevant, For the future, I need to ask the questions that they are not asking. I care about the solutions that they are implementing today, but those solutions might be dead in the next five years. What I care about is my capacity or our capacity to ask the type of questions that over and over again will allow us to remain relevant for the future. Just a note on that, it's expected that in the next five years, there will be around 3.5 billion people coming out of poverty and engrossing the list of or engrossing the number of people in the in middle class. So we are going to have around 5 billion people in middle class and all of them will be accessing information. They will be accessing knowledge. Some of them will not be entrepreneurs, but a lot of them will be. So a lot of them will be focused on finding answers to solutions and some others, the curious ones, will be focused on asking the type of questions that will help them forecast what's going to happen in the future. So I think there's a, it's not even a fine line in there. There's a heavy line between those two groups of people, the ones who will be able to ask questions and allow to ask questions, and the ones who will be just focused on solving something today without thinking whether that's going to be sustainable or not in the future. So where did you develop your ability to ask questions? Like what did you have a mentor growing up that taught you that? Do you, uh, is there a particular books that you've read that asked you, or not asked you, but but taught you how to ask questions? How does someone develop that capability? I think just by not being afraid of asking questions. And, you know, what, I think that what happens very often is we fear to be ridiculed by asking a question for which we don't have the answer. And you know why that happened? Because in our current world, we still value 
expertise and knowledge more than we value ignorance. And this is a this is to me one of the heavy lines of all the things that I write. I'm not talking about the type of ignorance that makes you be a bigot or a, you know discriminate against anyone. Not that type of ignorance. I'm talking about the lack of answers to tough questions. So since we are afraid of being ridiculed, asking a question in a team and not having the answer to that question, many people decide not to ask it because they don't want their bosses to tell them, hey, I hire you to have the answer to those questions. How comes that you come to the team asking that question? I want you to have the answer. And that is the wrong type of message. We want to tell people, come to this table and ask all the questions that you want. It doesn't matter if you don't have the answer. We will build it together. But we want you to ask the type of questions that nobody else is asking right now because in one of those questions, we might find the entrepreneurial type of thing that we want to do in the future, the new innovation, the new discovery, the new invention, or the new thing that will be a hit for the future. So I think that just by not being afraid, I would say that that's the most important thing here, by not being afraid of asking questions, you will be able to develop your curiosity and your questioning skills. It's just going out there and saying, you know what? I don't care if people see me as an ignorant or they see me as the one who asks questions that there's no answer for. It doesn't matter. Just go and ask those questions because at least one of them will have the seed for the new innovation for the future. I think it's all about getting rid of that fear that we that we all have and that we were all it was all instilled in us when we were growing up. You know, when our parents were saying like, oh, don't ask that type of questions or I don't have the answer for those questions. Or when our teachers in the school were saying like, I'm the teacher and I'm the one who has the answer. So you can ask any question that is not within what I am going to be able to answer. So we need to get to break that cultural background and look forward without fear of asking questions. Well, I think that your message on uh, curiosity is is very unique, and I, I really like it. And the piece that you link it to fear, I think, is important for people to to understand. Was growing up in Venezuela? Did, did you say you grew up in Venezuela? Yes. Did growing up in Venezuela have a strong influence in shaping your motivation and your concept of the the, the world, or was there something deeper? Was there a mentor in Venezuela that helped shape your opinions and your thoughts? I think there were a few mentors in my life. You know, I. Now that I'm grown up <laughs> and, a, and an adult, I look back in my life and I'd say, well, I wish I had somebody, you know, 15 years ago telling me this or telling me that. I didn't. So you build that knowledge and those skills later in your life. But at least you you work on that. But yeah, I, ha- I had a few mentors and I, I think growing up in a developing country, dealing with so many problems at so many levels, definitely shapes the way you see the world. And one thing that I always advise to people, but always recently, I didn't, I didn't see the world this way before, but I see it this way now, is just be open-minded to everything that is happening to you. Once in my life, I was fired from a job and I, I hated it. You know, I was really, really mad. But what happened after that was amazing in my life. You know, I got a scholarship to come to the United States and then I got a job in the United States And if I hadn't been fired of that job, I would be back there still probably not being able to ask all the questions that I asked today. So that firing me happened for one reason. So not always are we able to see the reason in things, the, the the rationale behind things at the moment that those things are happening. The important thing is to be open minded, because to me, everything that happens in our lives has a reason. And sooner or later, that reason will surface and we will be able to understand why that happened to us and the value of that something in our lives. In Venezuela, there were many things that I had to deal with. You know, my family didn't have money. You know, it's a very complicated economic and political situation down there now. And when I was down there as well, so all those things taught me something. And those things made me the person that I am now. So the advice again is Be open-minded to valuing everything that happens to your life. Again, if you are in love with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and they come back to you and say like, oh, I want to break up with you, you're going to be heartbroken for a year or for months and you won't understand why that happened. But maybe two, three, four, five years down the road, you will say like, wow, 
I'm glad that that happened to me because that the reason for that to happen to me is this right now. Now I understand it. So that's, that's I think, one of the best advice that I have learned in my life that I think is valuable, I, I would say. Just knowing how challenging it is for the folks that I know that do move back and forth or do uh, visit family back and forth from Venezuela and my local community and knowing how ch- challenging it is, I, I imagine that would have a, a big impact on in, in someone's life. So being open-minded uh, is a is a great, great message. And, and I want to thank you for the uh, impact that you're that you're having on the world, Enrique, and just teaching my audience about uh, design thinking, about how to solve complex problems using design thinking, a little bit about social entrepreneurship and curiosity, and the relationship between fear and curiosity, and and uh, and being open-minded. You've given us some great food for thinking today, and I appreciate you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for for the for the invite. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully we can do a round two of this some some point in the future, Enrique. Sounds great. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you, Bill. You too. Thank you so much. So there you have it. That was Enrique Rubio. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with him. That was a little bit different spin than we've had on previous episodes, but I hope you enjoyed the mix. You'll find the information and resources we discussed on the show notes page at redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts. Also, make sure to check out our sponsor, CIO Scoreboard. Learn how to integrate your auditing and compliance objectives with real and practical IT security investments by using powerful visualization tools that remove the complexity from IT business decision making. Go to visualcio.com to learn more. Until next time, I'm signing off. Thank you for listening and have a great day. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.